Sunday, 24th of May, 1914, Galloway, Scotland. Hi everyone, welcome back to the 39 Steps. Steam arising from the train. The occupants of this carriage were an old shepherd and his dog. A wall-eyed brute I mistrusted. The man was asleep, and on the cushions beside him was that morning's Scotsman. Can we nick his cane? No. Let's read the paper. The Scotsman! Let's have a look. What's the headlines then? Um, Mary Noland underwear? That's probably not what we're looking for. Mold sale of white begins today with all of its beauties and bargains conveniently laid out. Wonderful. Mm, mate, okay, this looks like adverts. It's full paid advertisements, yeah. Let's, let's have a look at the, the news. My god, what is it? Mr. Master Ban defeated. Great Unius victory at Ipswich. No? Professor Bergson Guildford Lectures? No, I don't think so. Empire Day Murder Shocks London. Scotland Yard's top officers have been called into action following the brutal slaying of a decorated British officer in the affluent apartment block in London near Port Portland Place. The killing took place during last week's Empire Day celebrations. The as yet unnamed man was discovered in the first floor flat on Saturday morning by its valet, Mr. Paddock. Intriguingly, the victim was not in charge of the apartment and the owner was not to be found. Even more intriguing was the arrest of a local milkman found whistling in the hallway of the apartment. A mere five minutes away from Oxford Street, Mr. Paddock sprang the alarm and had the young man arrested. Oh dear. Mr. Paddock had informed the police that the dead man's name is Sir Captain Digby of the 40th Gurkhas and he had been at the apartment four days. As yet, Scotland Yard has been unable to confirm the identity and the details of the murderer are also sparse. It's the second body to have been found in this very apartment block in the past week. Just six days earlier, the American businessman, identified as Mr. Scott Ca uh, Canavan, was found in his apartment having committed suicide. Neighbour Mrs. Tweesden said, We've never seen anything like it. This is the respectable part of the city. Safe behind closed doors, at least until now. I'm all shook up. Uh huh. And cancelled my milk order. McGilvery assured residents that there was nothing to be concerned about, apart from two people died in that apartment in the last week. There appears to be no connection between the deaths, and that latest killing is most likely a result of a financial dispute. Oh, I see, look, that's the highlighted bit, and there's also highlighted bits on this page. Oh, that's clever. That's clever, save me looking at the entire paper. Uh, what do you got down here? Um, rain interferes with Hyde Park Parade. Rain marred the annual uh, Empire Day Parade in Hyde Park on Saturday afternoon and prevented the attendance of Lord Roberts. Who had promised to take the salute. The Earl of Earl of Meath, however, braved the storm and with bared head received the salute from over 6,000 6, men and boys, whilst most of the spectators fled. Fortunately, the storm did not break until towards the end of the march past, and the preliminary evolutions of the great muster were watched with interest. The parade, which was under the patronage of Prince and Princess Alexander of Tech. Uh, was under the command of Lieutenant General Sir Henry H. S Settle. Okay. What do we got to have a look at here? Missing airmen. Warships search the English Channel. A one known aviator whose intention is to uh, attempt the transatlantic flight was announced last week. Was expected in London on Saturday morning in order to take part in the aerial derby competition arranged for the afternoon. He was known to have started from the aerodrome at Villa Comblay, 
at half past four in the morning, but he failed to put in an appearance to the English side of the channel. And as the day wore on without bringing any def definitive news of him, considering the anxiety of his account gradually made itself felt. Inquiries made in all directions proved fruitless, and yesterday anxiety deepened into serious alarm. Up to last night, Mr. Hamill's whereabouts, and indeed the place and time of his uh, disappearance, were much of a mystery as ever. Um, suffragette outages, outrages, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Oh, my suffragette's gone off. Can you uh, oh, switch it back off and on again? That'll work. No. Outrages, not outages. Um, Kingsport slashed in an, by an axe. Oh, dear, oh, dear. And we've got a... What is, what's the other headline we need to read down here? Uh, latest news. Portland place killer on the run. Okay, that's our apartment. Um... The owner of the apartment in question, Mr. Richard Hannay, is still missing. Yes. Yes. Interesting, eh? I could smell the alcohol on his breath. But I want it. Doggo's not letting me have it. Okay. We were approaching the station at which I had got out yesterday. The potato digging station master had been gingered up into some activity, for the west going train was waiting to let us pass. From it descended three men who were asking him questions. Sitting well back in the shadow, I watched them carefully. View from the train, the three men. There's two there, clearly. <laughs> I suppose that they were the local police, who had been stirred up by the Scotland Yard, and had traced me as far as this one-horse siding. One of them had a book and took down notes. Station staff. The old potato digger seemed to have turned peevish. The child who had taken my ticket was talking volubly. The moors. All the party looked out across the moor where the white road departed. I hoped that they were going to take up my tracks there. As we moved away from the station, the old shepherd began to stir. Quiet, you, you sh Where am I? Oh, where am I? You're on a train, travelling east towards Dumfries, in Scotland. Oh, oh. What comes of being a teetotaler? <laughs> I expressed my surprise at him. I should have met a blue ribbon stalwart. Oh, I am a strong teetotaler. I, <laughs> I took the pledge last month and was now I haven't touched a drop of whiskey since then. Not even a hug my knee. Though I was so tempted. Do we believe him? Oh, that's what I get. I hid better than hellfire and twine looking different ways for the Sabbath. What <laughs> did it? Here, I drink the car. Brandy. Now, being a teetotal, I keep it off the whiskey, but I was, oh, I was nip, nip, no idea this brandy and I'm <laughs> down. I'll not be real for a fun night. Oh my goodness me. 
My plan has been to get out some station down the line, but the train suddenly gave me a better chance. I looked out and saw every carriage window was closed and no human figure appeared in the landscape. Shush, doggo. So I dropped quickly from the carriage. It would have been alright, but for that infernal dog. I could not have made a more public departure if I had left a bugler and a brass band. Happily the drunken shepherd provided a diversion. He and his dog, which was attached by a rope to my, his waist, suddenly cascaded out of the carriage. They had forgotten me. I looked back, but there was nothing in the landscape. For the first time I felt the terror of the hunted on me. It was not the police that I thought of, but the other folk, who knew that I knew Scudder's secret and dared not let me live. It was certain that they would pursue me with the keenness and vigilance unknown by the British law, and that once their grip closed in on me, I should find no mercy. The mood did not leave me until I had reached the rim of the mountain and flung myself panting on the ridge high above the young waters of the river. I have eyes like a hawk, but I could see nothing moving in the whole countryside. Then I looked into the blue May sky, and there I saw that which set my pulse racing. I was certain as if I had been told that that aeroplane was looking for me, and that it did not belong to the police. These heather hills were no sort of cover if my enemies were in the sky, and I must find a different kind of sanctuary. I kept onwards. About six in the evening I came out of the moorland. Oh, this looks nice and quaint, doesn't it? As when a griffin. As when a griffin through the wilderness with winged step. As when a griffin through the wilderness with winged step o'er hill and moody dale pursues the Aramaz. Aram. Aram. Let's see. Aramaspian. Okay. Peat smoke and the savoury roast floated from the house. Mm. Good evening to you. It's a fine night for the road. Is that place an inn? At your service. I'm the landlord, sir. And I hope you will stay the night for, to tell you the truth, I've had no company for a week.
I pulled myself up onto the parapet of the bridge and filled my pipe. I began to detect an ally. Yo, young, to be an innkeeper? My father died a year ago and left me the business. I lived there with my grandmother. It's a slow job for a young man, and it wasn't my choice of profession. Which was? He actually blushed. I want to write books. <laughs> and what better chance could you ask? Man, I've often thought that an innkeeper would make the best storyteller in the world. Oh, not now. M maybe in the old days when you had pilgrims and ballad makers and highwaymen and mail coaches on the road. But not now. Nothing comes here but motor cars full of fat women who stop for lunch and a fisherman or two in the spring and the shooting tenants in August. There's not much material to be got out of that. I want to see life. To travel the world and write things like Kipling and Conrad. But the most I've done yet is to get some verses printed in Chambers' journal. I looked at the inn standing golden in the sunset against the brown hills. I've knocked a bit about the world and I wouldn't despise such a hermitage. Do you think that adventure is only found in the tropics or among gentry in red shirts? Maybe you're rubbing shoulders with it at this moment. That's what Kipling says. Brother romance and all unseen bromance brought up the 915. Um, yes. But here's a true <laughs> tale for you then. And a month from now, you can make a novel out of it. A story of epic proportions. Mr. Richard Hannay was a successful mining magnate from Kimberley. Then his luck changed and he ran into serious financial troubles. They were here for the money. I owe you nothing! Thugs chased Hane across the Kalahari to German Africa, pursuing him across the ocean. Going through top hats, isn't he? He got away and fled to London. But they tracked him down. My hat! <laughs> They had killed his friend, and they were chasing Hane yet. You're looking for adventure? Well, you found it here. The devils are after me, and the police are after them. It's a race that I mean to win. Bye. It's all pure Ryder Haggard at Conan Doyle. You believe me? Of course I do. I believe everything out of the common. The only thing to distrust is the normal. Hmm. He was very young, but he was a man for my money. I think they're off my track for the moment, but I must lie close for a couple of days. Can you take me in? He caught my elbow in his eagerness and drew me towards the house. As I entered the inn porch, I heard from far off the beat of an engine.
He gave me a room at the back of the house with a fine outlook over the plateau. I smoked in the chair until daylight, for I could not sleep. The next morning I wanted some time to myself so I invented a job for him. He had a motorbike, and I, or a motorbicycle, and I set him off the next morning for a daily paper which I usually arrive with the post in the late afternoon. I told him to keep his eyes skinned and make note of any strange figures he saw, keeping a special sharp lookout for motors and aeroplanes. Then I sat down in a real earnest to Scudder's notebook. Let's have a look then. Information collected G January to May 1914. And those are Roman numerals. More Roman numerals. That's three of five. That's four of five. Hmm. The Hills of Home. I was born in the land of Scotland when the heather was turning brown. I grew in the hills of Scotland, then wanted to leave my town. I'm bored in the land of Scotland, please take me away. These desolate plains of Scotland are nowhere I wish to stay. Okay, nice little poem. What the innkeeper saw. Donald woke to the sound of hammering. Thump. The hammer did strike. Thump. The hammer pierced his brain again and again. The beam above his head creaked as the wind whistled around the small cottage. He heard his grandmother moving about in the next room. His father would have been at the river already, checking to see if the eggs had hatched. Okay. What's next then? Oh, that is the book. Okay, sorry. I thought that was the book and the letters. They're the same thing, are they? Um... Chambers Journal. Dear Mr. Fraser, thank you for sending us your latest poem, A Frozen Heart in Summer Days. We would be delighted to publish your poem in the January issue of next year. We will return a manuscript once it has been copied by a recorded post. Uh, Your sincerely, Edward Leathen, editor, Chambers Journal. A Frozen Heart in Summer's Days. I think we've covered everything there. One more thing we need to look at. Anything here? No, we're done. Oh, a motor vehicle. I glanced out of the window. There seems to be two of them, men in men in as, aquascutums and tweed caps. One was slim, the other was sleek. That was the most I could make of my reconnaissance. Ten minutes later, the innkeeper slipped into the room, his eyes bright in excitement. Two chaps below looking for you. They're in the dining room having whiskies and sodas. They asked about you and said they'd hoped to meet you here. Oh, and they described you jolly well. It's down to your boots and shirt. I told them you'd been here last night and gone off on a motor bicycle this morning. And one of the chaps swore like a navvy. I made him tell me what they looked like. One was dark-eyed, thin fellow with bushy eyebrows. The other was always smiling, with lisp when his talk. Neither was any kind of foreigner. On this my young friend was positive. 
I took a bit of paper and wrote words in German as if they were part of the letter. Take this down and say it was found in my bedroom and ask them to return it to me if they overtake me. Okay. Blackstone. Scudder had got onto this, but he could not act for the fortnight. I doubt if I can do any good now, especially as Carolides is uncertain about his plans. But if Mr. T advises, I will do my best. I... Your paper woke them up. The dark fellow went as white as death and cursed like blazes. And a fat one whistled and looked ugly. They paid for their drinks with half a sovereign and wouldn't wait for change. Now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Get on your bicycle and go off to Newton Stewart to the chief constable. Describe the two men and say you suspect them of having had something to do with the London murder. You can invent reasons. The two will come back, never fear. Not tonight, for they'll follow me 40 miles along the road, but first thing tomorrow morning, tell the police to be here bright and early. He set off like a docile child while I worked at Scudder's Notes. Aha. I had sudden inspiration. Scudder had said Julia Chesney was the key to the Carolides business and it occurred to me to try it on this cipher. It worked. The five letters of Julia gave me the position of the vowels. Chesney or whatever gave me the numerals for the principal constants. I scribbled that scheme on a bit of paper. In half an hour I was reading with a whitish face and fingers that drummed on the table. That evening we dined together. Out of common decency I had to let him pump me for information. I gave him a lot of stuff about lion hunts and the Matabelli War, thinking all the while what tame business these were compared to this I was now engaged in. When he went to bed, again I sat up. I had finished Scudder's book. <laughs>